This video is going to be about what I have invested into the car, including what I paid for the car, the amount of hours I have into it. Basically, I did up a thing of all the receipts added up all the time I got invested into the car and figured out all the costs. So I have it all written down here, so I'll get out of the car and I'll go over it with everybody and uh, so you have a little understanding of what it costs to do the car. Just don't hate on me when I show you what I paid for the car and whatnot. I got a pretty good deal on it. Um, now that I got it going and didn't have to rebuild the engine, I got an exceptional deal on the car. So let me uh, get out of the car and we'll go over this and uh, you can see what it break down the cost of everything on the 1960 Pontiac Catalina. Well, here's the breakdown of the costs on the car. I paid $950 for the car. I paid $180 to have the car towed here. I paid $72 for the title and taxes. You know, I have title transferred to my name and the taxes and whatnot. And I was $106.80 to have the keys made for the locks. So that came to a total of $1,308.80. The engine um, I went through, so I basically went through the cooling system and, you know, just went through everything on it. So I had to put a new water pump on it. The water pump was $119.98. The radiator, you know, for a used one was $125. Then I had to have it record at $490. As you saw, I just did the heater core and the water valve, $159 and $107. I put a fuel pump, and it's a Eldbrock fuel pump. I couldn't get, uh, find you know, a good original one. Um, the carb kit was one I had, but originally when I got it, I paid $10 for it. The fuel line, which I just recently replaced, the oil and filter. That was the first oil and filter. That wasn't the oil change I did just before I started driving it more. Um, the oil light switch, the little ball joint where the linkage connects to the kick down on the transmission was missing the clip so I had to buy a new whole new joint just to get that clip. Um, the hoses, the belts, uh, the igniter, the coil, the spark plug wires, the fuel filter, fuel hoses, just miscellaneous stuff and what I got into the engine is $1623.91. Then we go to the brakes, and uh, you can see basically the hydraulic hoses, the brake lines. The lines were the steel lines. Um, the, the hardware kit was basically your springs and the, all your anchors and stuff. The uh, four brake shoes were $74.90 for the four wheels, I should say. The brake drums being turned was $32. The wheel cylinders were $119.38, and the parking brake cable was $115.95. Now the the hydraulic hoses, there's two on the front and one on the rear, one to the rear axle, one to each front wheel. Um, then we get to the body and the, the filler, the cost of the filler, the tape, the undercarriage paint, which was basically a satin black rust-oleum. The 2575 gas mix for the welder, I had to put one bottle on that. That's $26.95. Um, the little pint of test paint was $42. The thinners and additives was $145.93. The gallon of paint was $222.59. I spent 60, you know, $67.72 on primers. So you can kind of see what I spent there on the body, and that's less the sheet metal. That's 66407. I had the sheet metal from other jobs and stuff, so that's kind of going to the shop materials cost. Um, as you can see, I have question marks there where the metal is. Um, then we get into the tires. I bought five tires, so the spare would be the same, including shipping. There are 795 for all five tires. Mounting and balancing, and that's breaking the old tires down, you know, and then I brought the rims home and cleaned them and painted them and took them back and had them mounted and balanced. That was $87.50. The hubcaps I bought on eBay were $140. Uh, Ray thinks he still has a couple of the original hubcaps of the car, so when I see them, I'll ask him about them. So I got $1,022.50 into tires. 
And then the other stuff, which is just miscellaneous stuff like the wiper blades and chat manuals and owner's manuals and just miscellaneous odds and ends that I needed was 248.39. Then I spent $860 on the front seat upholstery. Now the, or, well, it was upholstery for both the front and the back seat. Now I haven't got that yet and I haven't got the seats done. And that'll probably be another month or two before that is probably be at least another month, month and a half before I see the material. And it might be another month before I get the guy lined up to do the seat. And that looking at about twelve to fourteen hundred dollars in labor to do both the front and back seat. So less the seat cost, and if I take off the that's what I have into the car. And then if I add the seat vinyl and fabric, this is what I have into the car. And this is where I talk about shop materials and miscellaneous. Well, it costs money to run the furnace to heat the garage. It costs money to run the lighting in the garage to keep the lights on. You know, there's other materials, the glass beads for the glass blast, bead blast cabinet, you know, carburetor cleaner sprays, penetrants, lubricants, oils. All the miscellaneous stuff that you use, you don't, rags, paper towels, you just, hand cleaner, you just don't realize how much of that stuff you go through and it adds up. So most shops charge a 10% um, shop material on top of their, their cost of parts. So I just rounded it to $500. I think that's more than fair to cover the cost of heating and lighting and and materials, you know, various different things I've purchased around the place to work on the car. The original owner of this car, his name was Paul Chakowski. He bought the car in Detroit, Michigan. It was Ray's uncle that bought it brand new. He passed away in 1979. Ray purchased the car from his estate for $840. So Ray had owned it since 79. So the total cost less the seat, I got $5,751.45 into the car. Now if I come up with this labor cost, I worked on the car about 30 hours a week for 18 weeks. So I came up to 540 hours and that's give or take 20 hours. You know, like the other day I worked on the speedometer for two, three hours, and I, you know, didn't add that in, but that's where that plus or minus comes in, you know, give or take. So it's a pretty close uh, amount, 540 hours, and I, when I work on other people's stuff, I charge $100 per hour to work on their old car stuff. I don't like working on other people's old car stuff. I'd rather buy the car and work on it myself and then resell it. But on those rare occasions I do do work for people, it's $100 an hour. So at 540 hours times $100 an hour is $54,000 in labor. So when you see these cars on eBay and whatnot and people are asking, you know, 50, 60,000, that's because they're being charged these exorbitant labor prices. These shops that do car restorations generally are 100 to 150 dollars an hour. So if I did this car for somebody, they would be looking at 59,751.45. That's how much I'd be charging somebody if I restored, got, did what I did to this car for someone else. So, you know, it can be cost prohibitive if you have to pay somebody to do the work. That's where they get is with the labor. Um, you can see the difference between what it costs to actually in materials to get the car into the condition that's good, reliable driving car was just under $6,000, $54,000 for labor. So you're looking at close to $60,000 if, if uh, you know, that was the case. So... The seat labor may be around twelve to fourteen hundred dollars, so you're going to look at another, you know, twelve to fourteen hundred. So this cost up here is going to be probably between sixty-eight and sixty-nine hundred dollars once the seats are done. 
um, that kind of gives you an idea of what I do there. So if I sell a car, let's say I get $20,000 for the car, and I think when I do put it up for sale, I'm going to ask $20,000. I've had a lot of people tell me that are into these cars and I'm way under what I was originally talking, and that I should be looking at $20,000 for this car. And after looking at what some of these cars that are in terrible condition sell for, and uh, I don't think that's really out of line for a good, reliable, fun cruiser that's mostly original and in good shape. Um, other people might disagree with me, but they don't have to purchase the car. Um, if I get twenty thousand, that'll be remain to be seen. Generally, a car is worth what somebody is willing to pay for it. Um, but when I do put it up for sale, I'm going to ask twenty thousand dollars for it. So with 20000 and then if I take off, and now mind you, this isn't including the, the extra twelve or $1,400 for the labor on the seat that I have yet to dish out, would mean that I would make 14248 in profit. And if I take that 20000 for the sale, if I got $20,000 for the car and I take that profit, the $14,248.45, and divide it by the 540 hours I have into the car, I've made $26.38 an hour. So that's way under my going rate. And if I don't get that money for the car, that'll be less. And if I, you know, depending on, you know, I still have to factor in these costs here. So that number here will go down most likely. But this is just given a, a rough figure of the cost of getting an old car back in shape on the road. If you're good with mechanical stuff, a good do-it-yourselfer and can do everything, you're looking at about $6,000. And uh, that includes the price what I paid for the car, the towing, everything. If you're not good with with doing the cars and you got to pay somebody to do it, you're, then you're looking at close to sixty thousand dollars. And uh, you might think I'm crazy, but you know, go around to some of these shops that do these cars and price out what they charge to do them. I think you'll be a little set back. Um, they got to put dinner on the table too. They got to pay their utility bills. They got to pay their mortgages on their buildings. They got to pay health insurance and whatnot for their employees. There's a lot of overhead expenses at these shops, and uh, they got to pay them. So they charge, like I say, between 100 and 150. Now, I don't have as big overhead costs as they do, but I do have overhead costs. Like I say, the furnace doesn't run for free. The lighting doesn't run for free. Um, the air compressor doesn't run for free. The welder doesn't run for free. All that equipment costs money to purchase. So, you know, you got to make your money back when you can and uh, so that's why I come up with what I did and uh, I hope that it's informative to some people on what I did. Uh, so just a little bit more, yeah, that breaks down all the cost. I do want to drive the car a little bit and get a little bit of pleasure and enjoyment out of it. Driving it kind of works the bugs out. When I sell a vehicle I like it to be turnkey. I don't want the new owner to have issues. It's like, I like to do the car like I'm going to keep it for a long time. Do it right or don't do it at all. So basically I've done everything that really needed to be done, done. It's a, it's a pretty good car so far. Um, and I'll drive it like I say. I, I use these cars. I love driving my old cars. I drive the Chevy a lot. I, the Chevy had 58,000 miles on it when I bought it in March of 1978. It's got 192,000 miles on it now, so I do drive my cars. This car has 25,610 actual miles on it, and uh, you know I might put a few thousand miles on it before I sell it this summer, but I'll probably sell it before fall. Um, so yeah, I might take it on a road trip. I've been talking with a few people and seeing if I can strike up some interest in uh, doing a trip across old Route 66 from drive from here to Chicago, catch Route 66 in Chicago, and then drive down through St. Louis and across to Santa Monica, and then just take the interstate back. Um, so that's kind of, you know, if-ish, and uh, 
we'll see. You know, it's, a trip like that's not going to be cheap, and especially you know, on a car that's getting 15 or 16 miles a gallon that has to have premium gas. And then you're looking at lodging and food, and if there's any issues with the car, then I'm having to pay somebody to work on it. And uh, so that's why I kind of want to drive it a bit, make sure it's all in good, perfect tip-top running order. So if I do take it on a long road trip like across the country, hopefully I don't have any issues with it. So yeah, so it's been a, a fun, good, fun car. I'm going to try and meet up with Ray yet, so I'll be putting a video up. Uh, if Ray isn't camera shy, I'll put a video up of Ray and I when I go take Ray for a ride in the car. I, I imagine he's probably up north. Um, I called him several times and left voicemails. I haven't had a return call, but I'll connect with them and meet them up at Haney's there in center line at nine and a half in Van Dyke. We'll have breakfast. I'll take him for a ride in the car. He goes there for breakfast pretty regularly, so it's convenient for him. And uh, it's not too far for me, so it's kind of convenient for me. And they have good food there, so I enjoy going there for breakfast and eating. Their food is really good. They serve breakfast and lunch. They don't serve dinner. So if anyone lives in this southeast Michigan area, and you're looking to go out and have a good breakfast or lunch, I would highly recommend the Heenies. They're on Van Dyke at about nine and a half mile. It's an old Howard Johnson, 1959 Howard Johnson. And, uh, kind of a neat place. So we'll get some video up when I uh, meet up with, with Ray. I think there's a Cars, Carts, and Coffee meet on Sunday if I have the time and if the weather is nice. It's, I know it's Easter Sunday, but like I say, I have other commitments on Easter, so I don't know if I can get to the cruise or not, but there's a, I don't know, maybe it's Saturday, I'll have to look, but it's this weekend, if I have, uh, have the time, I'll run to that, and I'll get some video of that, and I, it would be the first one of the year, I don't know if a lot of people probably still have their old cars in storage around this area. Um, I used to store my 59 Chevy at a local fairgrounds for the winter, and I wouldn't get it out until around the end of April. And uh, So a lot of people probably still have their classics in winter storage, and, or they're just getting them out now. And uh, So you will probably won't really start seeing the classics rolling on the road for another couple of weeks on a regular basis, and I'll get to some car cruises and shoot some video of car cruises up, and... Uh, and um, just, you know, the going-ons with the car. I'll keep you updated if I have to do any more work on the car. Um, I'll, I'll be posting videos probably still pretty regularly. I don't know how often, probably not every day. But I'll still put videos up, and I, I, uh, I enjoy doing these. But this video diary on this car, when I bought the car, I, I've had, I've done a lot of cars over the years and when I first started doing them you know most of them were 35 millimeter slides that was before video cameras and GoPros and cell phones we're talking you know the late 70s and uh, by the 80s my dad had got a VHS camcorder so I started borrowing that and using that to video my car restorations I like to make a diary of every car I do kind of what I've done to it and kind of expenses like this and keep track of everything on them. I've done that pretty much all with every car I've done. And uh, so it's just kind of interesting to know. And uh, I'll dig out some of those VHS videos are pretty interesting and I'll dig them out. My dad I think bought a thing to convert VHS to DVD, but I could probably I have a VHS player that actually still works. So I could probably play those tapes and just set the camera up and video it off the television set and upload them to YouTube. One of them was a frame-off restoration on a 38 Ford, and uh, the original engine was missing, and it had a 100-horsepower Mercury flathead V8 in it. And I rebuilt it and punched it out and did some minor porting and whatnot, and that engine was pushing about 120 horsepower, but it was done totally stock other than a little bit of porting and some boring and uh, it was a nice running uh, car. I have video of me driving the bare chassis around and uh, it was kind of neat so I'll try and 
get that, uh, somehow find it and upload that sometime in the future. I did a 1935 Chevrolet two-ton truck that was frame off or stored, although the drivetrain was not rebuilt. It's still the original drivetrain. I did that for Wolcott Mill Metro Park, so if you're out at Wolcott Mill, it's a green grain truck, two-ton Chevrolet. It has the 206 inline six and an overhead valve inline six, and that truck only had, I think, 35,000 miles on it. The roof and the hood and the fender, the roof was stoved in, the hood was stoved in, the fenders were smashed down because people jumped from the hay bales on the truck down on the roof, down on the hood, on the fenders and onto the ground. So I separated all the panels. I had to have them acid dipped. It was actually a pretty solid truck, a little rust in the bottom of the doors. It was never really used on the road. It was used in farm fields. And, uh, so that's why I had no miles on it. It ran good when when got a hold of the truck. And uh, the guy there at the park made the grain box, a wooden grain box for it. It turned out really nice. But it, it turned out it was a nice truck. The dashboard was all carved up. Everyone that had worked or ridden in the truck had carved their name and date and little messages into the dashboard. So it was all scratched up with all this interesting uh, stuff from the past. So before I restored the dashboard, I photographed it extensively. Um, it was just really, really interesting seeing all those dates and carvings of people's names and whatnot. It was a steel dash. It was, uh, the truck's green. And I, it was just really an interesting thing to photograph. And there's no way I could have restored that without photographing the originality of it. But the uh, Park wanted the truck restored like new, so I sent the gauge package and the speedometer and all that out and had it restored to a place in California. The temperature gauge was almost bulb type and it lost its charge, so I redid it all and came back like new. So anyway, just kind of rambling on about some of the past the vehicles I've done. I, as I said in the last one, I had a 60 Chevy I drove for years as an everyday car. I bought it to fix up and sell. Ended up driving it for seven summers as an everyday car. It was a 283 with a turbo glide. Um, it gave me no trouble. It had 90, I think 92 or 3,000 miles when I bought it. It had 160,000 when I sold it. Um, it still had all the original drivetrain. None of it had been rebuilt. It was the original little 283 ran great. It didn't use oil. Um, so anyway, I'm going to stop rambling and. Uh, I'll try and get some maybe some videos up of some of the older stuff I did in the past. Um, I don't know if I sell this car. I'll, if I find another one, I may do another restoration. Let's see. Um, I don't want to get into any more major rust buckets I've done some in the past. Or yet, but floor pans, quarter panels, just total rust buckets are just not the thing to, you know, I just don't want to get involved with major rust buckets anymore. This car is about one of the better cars I've done, um, probably the best. Um, it kind of spoiled me. I don't want to go back to doing rust buckets now. Um, but, you know, I might consider when I go to sell this car, if somebody has something they want to trade on with it, you know, with cash in, in a car or something in trade, I'm open. I've been known to horse trade vehicles and whatnot in the past, and I've even done even trades on cars, but I'm not going to do that on the podcast. It's going to be, if I take a trade in, it's not going to be more than a two or $3,000 value trade in um, max. So, and when I do sell a car, it's going to be a cash deal. We will go to the seller's bank and either get a certified bank check from their bank or they can withdraw cash from the bank and pay me in cash, we will go to their bank and get the, the funds. I've been, had other people try and scam and shaft me and that's not going to happen again. And uh, so just kind of going over things with the car and I mean, like I say, when I do go to sell it, the asking price is going to be 20000 and you know, I will negotiate and I will consider trades. I like old machinery so there isn't there's a lot of things I would consider other than cars, um, but you know you're still going to be spending cash on top of your trade. But I like to keep an open mind. You never know; you might find some real cool, interesting thing to to fool with and play with.
And, uh, you know, I used to collect, I worked in the boat industry for a long, long time. So I used to collect the antique outboards. I still have a slew of them. Um, I'm going to start selling some of them because I don't use them anymore. I'm going to keep the old Johnson A Pose Twins, and that's the rest of them. Uh, so, all right, I'm done rambling. I'm going to let everyone go. I'm glad everyone's watched my videos, and uh, I hope everyone's enjoyed the diary on the 60 Pontiac and getting it back on the road. And uh, I will keep updates on the goings on with the car. If I meet up with Ray, I'll put a video up uh, with Ray if he's not camera shy again. And, uh, and I'll, you know, put videos up of, out with cruises and whatnot. I'll, the going ons with the car and whatnot. And if I have to do any other repairs on the car, of course, I'll put that on too. So again, thank you for watching my videos. Hope you enjoy them. If you uh, do enjoy them, really enjoy them, want to subscribe to my channel, feel free to. Thank you kindly for watching. And I thoroughly enjoyed doing the video diary.